If there's one thing to hate about the Attitude Era, is that every space of time following it also had to be some kind of era. The John Cena era, the new era, the PG era. The word era has now lost so much meaning, Callisto made more sense after the WWE draft. Whether I like it or not though, the Ruthless Aggression era is an official period in WWE lore and you'd be amazed, quite frankly, what wrestlers actually managed to make appearances during it. I'm Simon from What Culture, and this is 10 WWE Ruthless Aggression era stars you totally don't remember. Number 10. Mark Jindrek Now, it's fair to say that maybe some of you do remember Mark Jindrek. Had original plans been greenlit, however, a hell of a lot more people would now have that name etched in their brains. Before he vanished off our television screens, Jindrak was penciled in to join Evolution. That's right, that Evolution. Mark would have rubbed shoulders with Triple H and Ric Flair, which, as you would imagine, would have pushed his career in an utterly new and larger direction. Don't feel too bad for the man, though. Jindrak has since gone on to be a very successful pro wrestler, particularly in Mexico. Good stuff, Mark. Number 9. Shaniqua. I remember Linda Miles. Co-winning the second series of Tough Enough alongside Jackie Gaida, she was far more athletic than other females WWE were seemingly interested in way back in 2002, a look that easily made her stand out from the crowd. What I do not recall though is her run as Shaniqua. With the Basham brothers of all people, portrayed as a dominatrix, because why not? The character died a death. If we're being honest, you'd have been better off taking on the role of nonsense that was the gobbledygooker. At least people still talk about that. No one is even thinking about Shaniqua, apart from you and I. But that is accentuating circumstances. Moving on. Number 8. Bam Neely Who? Bam Neely, of course. Serving as a bodyguard for Chavo Guerrero in 2008 and literally nothing more, nearly feels like a missed the boat opportunity to be honest. Being a monster isn't a guarantee for success in pro wrestling, but at 6 foot 7 you think he could have been given something else to do other than protect a man that was once Kerwin White. WWE clearly didn't agree. After he and Chavo broke up in October, Bam was released the following January with barely a whisper. At least he had his ruthless aggression five minutes, mind. Number 7. Sylvester Turquay In a business where names can be changed on a whim, why the hell did WWE ever go with Sylvester Turquay? It gets worse if you shorten it and say it quickly too. Sly Turkey! Honestly. A complete afterthought in 2016, Turquay's whole gimmick was that he was an out-and-out -out MMA fighter which meant he was going to kick your ass. Accompanied by Elijah Burke, the idea definitely had legs, but there was one huge problem. No one cared. Set up to feel like a genuine threat to everybody on the roster, he was booked in countless squash matches that all failed to get over. Six months later, he was released. So long, Turkey. Number 6. Manu One lesson to learn here, kids. Don't have a bad attitude. If you do, you'll get nowhere in life, and if you ever make it to the WWE, they'll kick you to the curb. That was the story of Afa, yes, I am related to Roman Reigns, while also being the son of the wild Samoan with the same name, an Hawaii junior, or just Manu in the world of kayfabe. A huge success in FCW, he had a short run with Cody Rhodes and Ted DiBiase as the third member of the Legacy, the idea being that each member had a famous wrestling father, but was soon ousted from the company because, well, he was a bit of a dick backstage. All in all, he barely lasted half a year. Ruthless indeed. Number 5. Jesus. Okay, we've arrived. It's your weird trip down memory lane as we recall the time John Cena was booked in a match against Jesus for the US title because Jesus had tried to stab Cena in a nightclub. Better still, he only did this because Carlito told him to. Right, fine, better settle this in the ring as opposed to, oh, I don't know, court. Taking place at Armageddon in 2004, Jesus, obviously, lost and then soon vanished into dust. He did, however, also fill the role of one of the conquistadors. So he had a good run. Number 4. KC James The world looked pretty good for KC James in 2006. He was in a tag team with Idol Stevens, the future Damian Sandow, that was managed by Michelle McCool and had been given the opportunity to go after the WWE tag team titles. As I'm sure you know, they never got the belts. And then they split up. From there, James just disappeared off everyone's radar quicker than the XFL. He did manage to have a blink and you'd miss him appearance on WWE's revamped ECW in 2007, but he was deemed surplus to requirements soon after and sent packing. Number 3. Gunnar Scott While a more upsetting thought today than it would have been at the time, Gunnar Scott's biggest plus point in 2006 was that many saw him as the next Chris Benoit. 
feeling like it would make for a good story. Officials told him to play up to that as much as possible and even had him beat Booker T and team with Benoit on house shows. Then they decided he was acting too much like Benoit and soured on him. A situation that was more than a little unfair. Scott was soon demoted back down to developmental and released later that year. That's not a kick in the teeth. Don't know what is. Number two. Colin Delaney. Colin Delaney would probably thrive in modern day WWE. What you'd draw if someone told you to scribble down a stereotypical independent worker, it was a shock that WWE even decided to give him a shot at all in 2007. This was very much the six foot two and over club. I use that term shot lightly, however. While he often featured on ECW, he was essentially a jobber, constantly being sacrificed to the likes of the great Carly. So when a story emerged as Delaney being the protege of one Tommy Dreamer, things all of a sudden looked quite bright. Dreamer, as we know, is an ECW legend. Any association is a plus. Or at least it would have been had it been allowed to go anywhere. Delaney turned on his mentor during his 2008 Great American Bash match with Mark Henry just because. There was no real logic to it. He did it because why the hell not? And that, as they say, was that. Delaney was cut from the roster shortly before SummerSlam, ending a very curious run. Number one, Jackson Andrews. Jackson Andrews is six foot ten. Jackson Andrews has muscles. Jackson Andrews used to be a basketball player. You can almost see Vince McMahon licking his lips in anticipation, right? Well, you'd be wrong. When Andrews debuted on WWE TV in December 2010 as Tyson Kidd's bodyguard, before beating up David Hart Smith, it seemed like the world was his oyster. Most big dudes are always given some leeway in the so-called land of the giants, and surely this situation would be no different. Only it was. For reasons beyond anyone's knowledge, Jackson was sent back down to Florida in January 2011 after the smallest of all feuds with Mark Henry. Then in May, he was let go. What the hell did this man do? Some stories just don't make sense. The ruthless aggression era may have a stupid name, but at least it left us with some wonderful memories. Like that time Al Wilson wanted to marry Dawn Marie classic. Don't forget to let us know your forgotten ruthless aggression wrestlers in the comments below and then to like, share and subscribe. I'm Simon from What Culture. I'll chat to you again soon. Remember when What Culture did a magazine called Wrestling? We're doing another one called Wrestling. Issue 2 will feature a career retrospective on Brock Lesnar and an interview with Paul Heyman. It'll feature another How WWE Should Have Book written by this sexual modern stallion. There'll be all the usual top quality articles and artwork, as well as a top 50 list of the greatest SummerSlam moments of all time. Like last time, you can pre-order and buy your own copy in the link below at shop.whatculture.com. Order now to enjoy issue two of wrestling.